So there's, there's many ways to, to, to describe this. I mean, people have described overdiagnosis as misdiagnosis. Um, some have said, you know, the, 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 the problem is the expanding definitions of disease. People have argued that there's simply too much medicine. Um, there's lots of potential for false positives. And at the same time, there are people who are trying to counter this. The right care movement, the choosing wisely movement, the less is more movement. And it, it's possible this is the first time you've heard about these, these concepts, but, but this does give me a ray of hope because for the last um, six years, there has been an annual conference called the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference. I've attended five of the six of these uh, conferences. Just hang on a sec. So, so these are some of the organizations that I think are starting to get on board with this concept of overdiagnosis. The British Medical Journal is one of the, 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 the I think, leading academic uh, journals that's taking this on. Um, you've got um, uh, various other groups, Too Much Medicine. You've got... Uh, let me see one more. Yeah, you've got the Dartmouth Institute, you've got the JAMA Network, Right Care, the Loan Institute, really one of the leading groups that is, 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 is working to wind back the excess of too much medicine. Uh, Consumer Reports are involved in the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference. You've got the Foundation for Informed Medical Decision Making, who I think produce some of the best high quality information. Um, Society for Patient-Centered Orthopedics. These are all the people that you would see attending and being involved in both research and kind of activism around preventing overdiagnosis. Uh, and th there I took that this morning that is a screenshot from the uh, Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference this year. It's going to be in Copenhagen in August. Last year it was in Quebec City in Canada and the year before it was in uh, Barcelona. Um, these are fabulous conferences where you've got uh, both physicians and researchers and patient advocates who are really trying to say what can we do to really stop this medical ju juggernaut from uh, enveloping and, and consuming our lives. Um, I, I would uh, um, invite you to, to check out that. Uh, that see, I, what I like though is what they use as their symbol. Remember what I showed you that graph about the th thyroid uh, um, you know that, that, that idea that we're, we're, we're very good at finding more disease, but are we actually that good in preventing people from, from dying from certain conditions? So um, Choosing Wisely is one of the groups that's uh, uh, involved. I, I don't know if you've heard of Choosing Wisely. I'll talk a little bit about what they've done here in the US, but they're in various countries around the world, in Canada, the US, and Brazil, and Australia, and, and, and uh, many countries in Europe. Um, it's a campaign to help clinicians and patients Really, it's about engaging in conversations, really. So it's, what I like about it is that they ask professionals, give us examples of things in your own profession where there's overdiagnosis happening. So they ask the orthopedic surgeons and the cardiologists and the, and the neurologists and all of these specialties, they ask them to give examples for which they think themselves that there is overdiagnosis happening. And so the Choosing Wisely people were able to take these and kind of meld them down into discussion points and sort of educational stuff for physicians and for consumers. Uh, Choosing Wisely is active in, in Australia um, and in Israel. I, I like that uh, little graphic of the cat. This patient needs a cat scan, right? Meow. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, again, uh, each country, you know, uh, uh, has researchers and, and, and policymakers and consumers involved in, 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 in trying to promote this idea of doing things to prevent overdiagnosis uh, in Japan, um, choosing wisely in Japan. Um, let, me, let me just show you this a little bit more. Remember I told you about the, the, the incidence of thyroid cancer in, uh, in uh, Korea? Um, I just want to read that. In 1997, in a small town of Yongkwang in the southwest, a doctor opened a private internal medicine clinic. For some reason, he decided to provide page, patients ultrasonography screening for thyroid cancer. It did not take long for him to be uh, admired for saving many lives by detecting early thyroid cancers. The news rapidly spread to the nearby towns and cities, and clinics in other areas subsequently joined in the frenzy of detecting thyroid cancers. Um, through screening, uh, 
Uh, it was not a bad thing for doctors to detect early cancer since that supports this idea that you can prevent death by, by, by doing this kind of screening. Um, again, th th this is really the sort of poster for overdiagnosis. You can detect a lot of disease if you look, but the question is, are, you, are the people uh, essentially living longer? Okay? And in this case with thyroid cancer, the, 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 um, the, the, the people that die from thyroid cancer hasn't changed in, in, in over that 20-year period, but the, the finding of disease has grown rapidly. Um, I met this guy at, uh, at the National Institutes of Health a few years ago when the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference was there. We were sitting on the bus going into the NIH and we started chatting and he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I've written books. And, and so he, he knew me, but I'd never heard of him before. And, and he was the keynote speaker at the conference speaking on this various issue, this idea of preventing overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer in Korea. And so these physicians, they discovered, oh my God, we, have, we are creating huge amounts of harm in the population by, by giving people ultrasounds of their thyroids. We should stop doing that. And they, they created a national campaign and they've turned the curve on that. They've essentially you know, told physicians and you know, patients, stop getting your thyroid screen because it's going to lead to, lead to a lot of overdiagnosis. People will end up uh, having surgery and, and, and taking drugs and it's not going to extend your life at all. Uh, that's just for humor, that's a radiologist selfie. <laughs> yeah. So in, in Canada, it's been identified, this is CAIHAI, it's the Canadian Institutes of Health Information, and they've started looking at, you know, what's the rates of, uh, of unnecessary and overdiagnosis in Canada? You know, they estimate that, and you know, we've got a public health system, it's fairly different than the U.S. system, where because the public uh, is paying for things, they're much more restrictive in what they pay for. Sometimes appropriately, sometimes you wish they weren't so restrictive. You wish the free market would take over. But I can tell you, even in a restrictive system, they estimate that 30% of, um, uh, of patients, well, in, in this case, up to 30% of patients indicated in these uh, choosing wisely uh, recommendations that test treatments and procedures that are potentially unnecessary. You know, and they estimate that about a third, in a conservative figure, about a third of healthcare spending is wasted. And this, when I say wasted, it's spent on things that are unnecessary, uh, it, lead, uh, it leads to overdiagnosis, it leads to healthy people being turned into patients unnecessarily. Um, so he, here are just some examples uh, uh, that choosing wisely has suggests that people should question, right? Um, for example, the, the radiologist said, well, don't do imaging for lower back pain unless red flags are present. You know? A lot of times you go in with a back pain and someone will say, oh, you need a CT scan. Well, the benefits of a CT scan in diagnosing your lower back pain, I think are probably vanishingly small. But while they're doing a CT scan of your lower back, they're exposing you to, you know, uh, radiation that might be the equivalent to three to 500 chest x-rays. Um, and in fact, we have seen that, that the overuse of uh, uh, CT scanning in the United States has led to an increased rates of certain types of cancers because we're causing cancer by over-testing people. Um, you know, this is the second one. Don't use a... Uh, antibiotics for upper respiratory tract infections um, that are likely to be viruses, right? And, but this happens all the time. You've got the kid who wakes up in the middle of the night uh, screaming and the, pa and the parents are um, uh, clearly concerned, but what do they do? They'll take the kid to the clinic and they'll demand that the kid gets an antibiotic because he's got an ear infection, for example. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the, there, there's a good chance that the antibiotic's not gonna help. It might give the parent some sense of relief that they're doing what they think they should. But, um, you know, the overuse of antibiotics, as you know, has been uh, identified as a, as a major health problem. You know, we, we're, we're using so many antibiotics, um, we're developing more and more intense uh, infections that can't be treated by antibiotics, right? Um, don't order screening, chest x-rays, and EKGs for asymptomatic or low-risk outpatients, which I thought I was when I went and got that EKG test. Uh, you know, any test has the potential to deliver a false positive, 
which means they tell you that you have something that is going to go on to hurt you when uh, it, it may not be true. They also do false negatives as well, which is there may actually be something wrong with you and the test says you're perfectly healthy. So the, 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 there is a problem uh, in terms of the, the, um, the, uh, the accuracy and the, and the sensitivity of, of, of a lot of screening tests. Um, don't screen women with pap smears of under 21 years of age. You know, there was a study um, where they were screening uh, nuns. You <laughs> and uh, nuns, wow. You know, and the, the, the question being is that, well, if you don't have sex, you're unlikely to, be, to develop anything that a pap smear is going to help to detect. Um, uh, don't do annual screening blood tests, okay? So this, this, is, this is something that, uh, that I have spoken about and I've argued with others about, is this the idea of having the annual physical. The annual physical being, well, uh, I feel a duty to myself and my family to go to my doctor. I don't have any complaints, but I'm going to go to my doctor, schedule an appointment so he can run, or he or she can run a bunch of tests on me to, to see if I have any signs of disease. In theory, that sounds like smart preventive health. In practice, though, what happens when healthy people go... If you're already healthy, it's unlikely the doctor's going to make you healthier. So what's likely to happen if you're already healthy is that you will get possibly tests and treatment tests that will lead to treatments that may uh, make you worse off. You can, be cold, you can take your... your uh, so so the, the whole annual checkup is, is, is being drawn into question. Is that if you're perfectly healthy, going to the doctor for just an annual physical is not a very wise thing to do. But if you have any problems whatsoever, any symptoms whatsoever, you should see your doctor. That, that is a good reason to go and visit your doctor. I'm not saying don't, you know, avoid doctors. But I'm saying avoid doctors for unnecessary uh, visits and, 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 and perhaps to make you feel that you're doing your best. Um, you know, this idea of measuring vitamin D in low-risk adults, I, this is controversial. There is some research that says vitamin D, you know, we're all vitamin D deficient and it's causing all kinds of uh, health problems and other diseases. Others, research which has said we are actually, uh, by using supplements, uh, vitamin D supplements, we're actually increasing certain types of risk. I would say that the, 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 the jury is probably uh, not in yet about vitamin D. But what they're saying here is don't be testing people routinely for vitamin D. You're just going to make them worry and you're probably going to force them to go on to take uh, supplements. Well, maybe people will spend more time in the sun, which would, might be a good thing. Um, but if you're, if you're otherwise at low risk, there's no benefit of this according to the, uh, the Choosing Wisely people. Um, routine screening mammography. Um, this says for average risk average risk women age 40 to 49. I mean, it used to be, and, and when I spoke about this the other night, um, they used to recommend women 35 and over get an annual mammogram. This was in the early 90s. And I can tell you they don't do that anymore. Um, in fact, most uh, countries in the world, uh, they would say that women should start semi-annually screening at about age 50. Um, Others are arguing that, that the advantages of, of, of screening mammography are vanishingly small. You have to test something like 2,000 women, give 2,000 women mammograms every year for 10 years to save one life. So which means that the, 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 the yield for, annu for annual mammography screen is very low. Uh, and I know there's a, another speaker here, Ben, uh, who, who argues that, that mammography is actually increasing your risk of developing breast cancer. So, um, so even for the choosing wisely people to say, you know, don't offer screening for women under 50, that's a start. I mean, it's not, it's probably, I would say, not the, not the strongest bit of advice, but that's a start. Uh, again, the number eight there about annual physicals uh, on people that have no symptoms uh, and no significant risk factors. Um, <clears throat> So that number nine, don't order DEXA. This is the dual energy x-ray uh, absorptometry screening for osteoporosis on low-risk patients. You know, the osteoporosis industry is huge. It's, it's monolithic. And as I said before, it has so much controversy around it. Um, the idea that you can somehow improve someone's um, bone density so that they're going to avoid um, the worst aspects of osteoporosis 
which is falling and breaking a hip. Um, th th that idea is, 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 is simply not true. Um, there are ways to, to, to stay. Uh, so osteoporosis, is a, a lot of it is about, is about um, f f um, I would say fear-mongering, mostly women, that as you get older, you're going to lose bone density, and therefore you should do something about it. You should get it measured. You should check your numbers. You know, you check your numbers. You should alter your diet or start taking pharmaceuticals to try to reduce your risk. Um, you know, things like Tai Chi and yoga, very good for people, especially as you're getting older, because the most important thing about hip fractures is falling. It's not having low bone density, it's falling, right? And so when you look at studies on, you know, who are the people that are falling and breaking their hips, what, what, what's that associated with? Well, it's associated with taking certain types of sedative drugs, uh, benzodiazepines, so people uh, get dizzy, maybe taking too many antihypertensive drugs, too many drugs to lower your blood pressure. So uh, grandma stands up in the morning and, and because she's on three antihypertensive drugs, she gets dizzy and she falls down, she breaks her hip. That, w whether she had low bone density or not is irrelevant in that equation. If she's going to fall at that age, you know, she's going to probably break something. And the, for a, a lot of elderly people, falling and breaking a hip can be the beginning of the end. I mean, this, is, this, this can lead to hospitalization. And of course, once you enter the doors of a hospital, your likelihood of developing other infections and, and sepsis or being given um, other things that aren't likely helpful uh, increases. Um, anyways, what's the last one there? Oh yeah, th thyroid function tests, of course. You know, if, if the doctor is coming out with, uh, you with an ultrasonograph and wants to test your thyroid, you might just say, um, I, I don't believe there's any benefit in doing that, and please don't try to turn me into a person that's now worried about his or her thyroid. By the way, thyroid um, conditions are really common, really. There, there are, if you look in the top, say, 20 most prescribed drugs in the United States, there's going to be drugs that treat thyroid, uh, levothyroxine, um, you know, probably two out of five women that I know my age and older have been diagnosed with some level of thyroid dysfunction and they're taking drugs for that. You know, I don't know whether that's really a, a wise thing to do, but it really demands us to ask, why do we see so much thyroid disorder in mostly women? I'm not sure. Um, um, but it, but it's certainly testing thyroids with ultras, uh, ultrasound uh, is not a good idea. So this is the Choosing Wisely Canada um, suggestions on, these are just questions you should ask your doctor. And, and, and I would argue that the best way to prevent overdiagnosis is to have an informed and involved uh, and a questioning patient. Um, I have found it personally very difficult to challenge my doctor because he's a doctor. I, believe it or not, he, the, the other day he wanted, well, he tried to get me to take statins. Uh, it was, um, you know, the, 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 uh, we, we all need a little bit more courage. And, and I think if you've got a good doctor, a good doctor is going to accept questions, and good questions, you know. Um, it's not an emergency to do something about some high level of your cholesterol, or if your blood pressure is slightly elevated. These are not are emergency situations. You have time to, um, to ask questions and then to question the answers that you get, okay? And, you know, I like the last one the most. And I have a, a at the end of my book on screening, um, I tell this anecdote about my son. So we're, we're in the... Uh, we're in the, the, the dentist, and uh, he's being told that, um, um, he, well, we, we took him to the orthodontist, because that's what good parents do. And the orthodontist said, uh, again, don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. The ortho so the question is, does my kid need braces? Braces are expensive. It's a fairly invasive thing. Braces are very common, though. So, so the, 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 the dentist takes x-rays and photographs and... And it was a very slick kind of operation. It had these big screens with, you know, focusing in on your kid's mouth and, and, the, and the orthodontist. You know, this is a very educated, wise person saying, you know, we can see some problems down the road, you know, because his jaw is growing in this way and his teeth are, are, um, are like he had his adult teeth, but he still had a 12-year-old jaw, right? 
And I got common sense. And I go, well, his jaw's going to get bigger. Like, and that's what I challenge the, the, the orthodontist with. Like, you know, I'm not going to go and, you know, spend $6,000 and get braces right away because common sense tells me that my son's jaw is going to get bigger. If he has crooked teeth as he's older and adult, he'll have a job. He can pay for the orthodontics himself. <laughs> right? By the way, the, the, the son was the second one. The daughter, she did get braces. Because I was, I was just like, well, whatever, doctor. You know, I was like, like you know, uh, Bambi in the headlights. You know, and you've got this, this professional coming at you with this advice. You just go, well, okay, I guess so. Anyways, I was prepared to challenge. Because like, I started doing some reading. I'm like, you know, they're, they're asking people to see the orthodontist with a 12-year-old kid who has not finished growing. I mean, he was like this tall at 12. He's now this tall at 18, right? And, and his face is perfect and his teeth are perfect. Yeah, I was right. His jaw grew and his teeth fit perfectly and he's got a nice smile. He's very lucky. He, he looks like his mother, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, 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 so what I said in the book, when we were at the orthodontist, um, the orthodontist gives us this big spiel. My son's in the chair and, 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 um, and the, the, the orthodontist says, do you have any questions? And I said, well, you know, I already told you my questions. Like, isn't the kid's jaw going to get bigger? And, and my son said, what happens if I do nothing? Right? The, the orthodontist was basically had the forms there. Sign the forms. We can get you going. We can get you on a payment plan. We can get this thing happening. Right? Like, it was kind of like a move it along. And my son was, what happens if I do nothing? And I was so proud of him at that moment because I said, he's been actually listening to me, you know, over the years when I said, you know, doing nothing is sometimes the right thing to do. And he was asking the doctor, and that's a very good question to ask a doctor. You know, oh yeah, so I've got high blood pressure. What happens if I do nothing? And he said, well, the, you know, you'll have a slightly increased risk of a heart attack. Okay, well, how much increased risk? And the doctor should be able to answer that question because they have, you know, they have cardiovascular risk reduction tables. They can tell you, you know, if you're, you know, like me, 54 years old, my level, cholesterol level, if I measured it, was this, my blood pressure is this, uh, my hemoglobin A1C is this. And they say, well, your risk of having a heart attack over the next 10 years, given your, the numbers that we put in this calculator, your risk, Mr. Castles, is, is going to be 6%. Okay, so what happens if I take a, a drug to lower my blood pressure because you might think it's high? Well, we could reduce that risk in the calculator. Yeah, it'll drop it down to 5.8%. Okay, so what you're telling me is that I can take a drug every year for the rest of my, or every day for the rest of my life to reduce my risk of having a heart attack by 0.2%. That's really not worth it to me. Anyway, so, so when someone is coming at you, so doing nothing in this case, doing nothing is the right thing for me. Everyone might have a different sort of choice about that. And, and people worry also about their family history, right? Because a lot of times they'll say to you, oh, you know, Mr. Kaus, your, your mother had a heart attack, you know, your father had cancer. You know, you're, you're at high risk of those things. I say, well, you know, don't give me that. The leading causes of death in this country are cancer and heart disease. Of course, if I live long enough, one of those two things are going to get me. Unless the third thing could be a shaving accident and I bleed to death. <laughs> so, so the, uh, um, anyways, I go on. I mean, the, the choosing wisely, and I think in the U.S. as well, they've got, they've got posters and patient-oriented uh, stuff that is just trying to make a little bit of light fun about too much medicine, right? And you know what? I, I chose this one. There was a bunch of them. I chose this one because I really like mustard. And I like a little bit of mustard on a hot dog. I can tell you, that is not very appetizing. And it's just like that with medicine, I think. A little bit will make things better. Too much, and well, 